I'm Max. Um, I'm in the engineering department working on atomistic materials modeling. And in the space of a half an hour, I'm going to try to um, uh, teach you how, what materials modeling is, why it's important, and how a hot topic like machine learning will apply to it. Um, so let's start with materials. First of all, what are materials? How do we define them? Well, they're the building blocks of our human world. So everything from the concrete and steel that hold up our buildings to the, um, to the fabric that makes up the clothes that we wear to the silicon in all the devices, in this projector, in this phone, and in, uh, in, in this laptop, and to the cells, to the, to the skin, the tissues, the bones, the muscles that hold us together and allow us to move. And with advances in materials, we can do some pretty amazing things. They're, they're behind some of the most visible engineering achievements of our time. We can build buildings that reach up to a kilometer into the sky. We can make clothes that repel um, mundane things like wind and water, but also fire, knives, bullets. Um, we can make supercomputers super that fit in our pockets or on a table. Um, and in the near future, we may even be able to print out uh, replacement organs um, just by using scaffolding and cells. But in order to keep on making these advances in engineering and, and materials, we need to keep on furthering our, our, our understanding of how these materials work um, and why they're so good at what they do. And um, hopefully then we can come up with new materials that will do more amazing things. Um, so yeah, uh, and to do this, um, I'm in the field of materials modeling, which is um, specifically atomistic materials modeling, in which we try to understand how materials work at the scale of individual atoms and molecules. So we, we try to model how the, ab how the molecules um, in, in a material um, interact with each other and give rise to the properties that we, that we see on a macroscopic scale. So this is, um, this is of course useful to us because we can, make, uh, we can make predictions. If our models are good, we can predict, um, for example, given the, the chemical composition of, of some sort of material, we can pre predict how it will behave um, in, in the real world. And we can also set up a useful feedback with, um, with experiments. So we can use our models to make predictions, which will tell experimentalists sort of where the interesting things that we can look at. Um, and then through that experiment, let's do experiments and, and, and tell us, you know, what are the deficiencies in the models? How can we improve them? What do we need to, you know, what, what do we need to change? All right, so I do modeling at the atomistic scale. And for, um, I don't know, for many of you in the room, atoms and molecules may be a very abstract concept. So I'm going to try to illustrate the scale at which, um, at which all this stuff takes place and how that relates to our everyday experience. So first of all, let's, uh, let's start at the regular everyday length scales. You know, humans are about like a meter tall or whatever. Um, the smallest things we can see are a little smaller than a millimeter, like a maybe a few hundred microns or so. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's just zoom in a bit. Let's take that millimeter and blow it up to the size of this room. That's about five meters, so 5,000 times zoom. And now at this scale, we can start to see a lot more detail. We can see individual cells, like bacteria can be about maybe this small to maybe about this big. You can see a human hair, it's maybe um, about this wide, and you can see all sorts of nasty little insects as, as well. So, um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's take another zoom. Let's take another one of those 5,000 times zooms. A millimeter goes out to 5,000 meters. I mean, goes out to five meters. And now we're getting to a, a much finer level of detail. So like that E. coli bacterium would now fill the Churchill College dining hall, which is, which is a fun thought. Um, we can also start to see, <laughs> we can also start to see viruses. Um, so like an HIV would be about three meters wide, which is also pretty scary. HIV is scary enough as it is. Um, and uh, if, if we look very closely, the strands of DNA would be maybe about this wide or so. And if you look closely at the DNA, you can, you can start to see that it's made of little individual atoms and molecules, and it falls, has this little grainy structure. Um, yeah, so that's really cool, except now at this level, if you zoom down far enough that the level that, that the laws of physics that we know from, from, from everyday experience no longer really apply. We're in, we're in the quantum world now, and everything is governed by, um, by the equations of quantum mechanics. So read the Schrodinger equation. All common materials that we know are governed by this equation, um, you know, minus some relativistic effects. I won't go into those. But um, yeah, it it's actually looks really simple. So. Um, yeah, to do material science, we just take this thing. It's, it's a simple eigenvalue equation. Um, we, we plug in the, the parameters for the material that we're interested in, and we solve this thing. So we have solved all of material science and all of molecular biology, too. 
Um, yeah, that's, that's the talk. Um, can you tell I'm a physicist? <laughs> right, no, no, of course not that simple. Um, the, the Hamiltonian, which is the thing that, that we apply to this quantum mechanical state to get our energy, um, is actually kind of complicated. And the thing that really messes it up is this thing which describes the interaction between individual electrons. So the reason this, this solving this equation is so damn hard is, is that it's, it's, we're trying to solve the quantum many, what's called the quantum many-body problem. Now, in physics, we, we can't even analytically solve the interaction of more than two particles under classical gravity, classical particles under gravity. Um, once you add three, you have to start with numerical solutions. So now, once you throw quantum mechanics into the mix, particles can be spread out, and um, there's, the, there's the uncertainty principle and all, all this sort of stuff. And, and their electrons, they, they interact via, well, basically the same interaction as gravity, but um, uh, it's, it's one over r squared. But, <clears throat> But yeah, once you throw that into the mix, it just becomes, you start to think, how is it even possible that we could ever begin to solve this equation? Um, but, you know, this was postulated, this equation was written down maybe close to 90 years ago. So um, we can, um, there, there, in the meantime, there have been lots and lots of approaches to, to develop to solve this approximately. And so you end up with, uh, with this alphabet soup of, of methods. We have Hartree-Fock for exactly accounting for exchange. Um, we have perturbation theory for accounting for various correlation effects. We have couple cluster. Um, and only one of those acronyms is made up. See if you can guess which one. Um, yeah, all the other ones I've actually used. Um, right, so yeah, so there's lots of ways of, of, um, of doing this. And now at this point you may be like asking, okay, why, why are we going to all this trouble to solve this equation when we might be able to describe, material, describe materials at a higher level? Like we can do experiments, we can, we can measure various things um, and, and do like fluid dynamic simulations. But there are, there are certain cases where you just can't get around it. Like for example, doing spectroscopy, like IR spectroscopy um, is, uh, is, is determined by, by the way that, atom, that the atoms vibrate within a molecule or within a crystal. Um, so, so you have to do the, use atomistic description. Similarly, X-ray and NMR experiments are, are also really quantum properties. Um, and then if, if we want to go ahead and, and actually, from the, from the chemical composition of a material, predict things like its density and viscosity um, and, and its liquid properties um, without having to measure them by an experiment, maybe because we can't make the material yet or because we want to try out many different kinds of candidate materials, um, well, we, um, th those properties are also determined at the atomistic scale. By, they're determined precisely by how the molecules, the, the, the smallest units of this material interact. Uh, so we, we really do have to do, um, have to do atomistic simulation. So at this point, you may, um, you may also be wondering, well, how are we going to do atomistic simulation? I mean, we can't just like, simulate all the molecules in this bottle of water. That's 10 to the 23rd atoms, and you need more computer memory than we have probably from all the matter in the universe um, in order to do that. So what we do instead is we instead sort of cheat, we just take a very small box, fill it with molecules, and then computationally glue the ends together so it looks like an infinite um, piece of material. So that's, um, you, you know, when you're working at these length scales, like a, a macroscopic piece of, of fluid is basically infinite in all dimensions. So we do this. Um, and then in order to get these properties that we're after, we try to sample lots of configurations, lots of different ways to pack the atoms within that box, you know, get to solve the equation, get, get, the, get the energy for each of these, and then, and then do some sort of statistical averaging um, to, uh, to, um, over our sample to get the properties that we're after. Um, so yeah, that's the general approach. Um, and we can think about doing it with, with these methods of, of solving the Schrodinger equation approximately that, that, I, that I mentioned before, like DFT is, is, is one of the most popular candidate methods. Um, but for a lot of these types of simulations, especially viscosity simulations, especially things like, like transport properties that require really big simulation boxes and lots of samples, um, we, we actually can't, we can't do it with our quantum mechanical with, with, with something like DFT because even, even the best methods will take maybe a few minutes per time step, and that's just not going to work. Um, so uh, in, in parallel with these, with these methods of, of solving the Schrodinger equation, there have also been lots of very approximate ways um, of, of parameterizing these interactions that have been developed. So one of the most common approximations is, is to, to use something called an interatomic potential. So we take, the, uh, take this, the energy of this molecule and assign a bit to each of the atoms. And then for, um, for the energy of a single atom, we just uh, approximate it as 
the sum of the interactions with its neighbors. All right, so one of the earliest approximations, which also dates back to, like, I think it's 90 years ago, um, is the Leonard Jones potential. And this is designed um, as, as to sort of mimic how two molecules or, or maybe noble gas atoms might interact. So it's a potential well. So as, as, we, take, as we take two atoms and bring them closer together, um, you'll see there's a, this downward slope in the potential. And so they, so they attract each other with um, a law that scales as 1 over r to the 6. So if you've done physics, this is actually the exact form of the, dis of the dispersion interaction that's dominant between neutral molecules. And then eventually they hit a point where, um, where, they, where they have sort of a, this optimal separation that's, that's the, the bottom of this potential well, and this is where they, where they like to hang out. But if you try to push them close together, well, we have the exclusion principle of quantum mechanics that, that means that they can't actually overlap. So there's this very strong, steep repulsive wall that actually keeps them from overlapping. So this thing has, so this, this potential has two parameters. We have, um, the, we have the distance, um, r min, at which, uh, at, which, um, at which the particles like to hang out, at which the, this, this energy is minimal. And we have um, the depth of the potential well, which is basically the strength of the interaction, how strongly they attract. Um, when you know when they're at some at some distance, so we can make uh, we can make models, we can make approximations of the quantum mechanical energy by uh, by taking this uh, by, by taking these parameters and adjusting them uh, basically until our simulations sort of reproduce the experimental results we are hoping for. Um, now I'm being I'm being a bit glib about this, but um, but it's it's important to emphasize that this is that these are empirical parameterization techniques. So they, they, make, they very often make use of experimental data um, to adjust the parameters of a potential un, until it works at, under some conditions um, that, that we've already specified for some specific material. Um, so this isn't, uh, yeah, so the, the, this isn't really the, the most systematic way of going about it. Um, and, and it's, in a sense, not, not, um, the goal isn't, ex isn't even to approximate the quantum mechanical energy. The goal is to get good simulations. But if we're after like, really accurate simulations, if we really do want to approximate this, um, approximate this quantum mechanical energy, like if we, if we uh, for example, for viscosity simulations, we really do need to get those interactions very accurately, um, then, then we do need more systematic approximation. And in, in this case, um, we can make use of an interesting observation that the potential energy surface of a molecule is smooth. So what that means is that if you take a molecule and you change it just a little bit, I mean, you don't expect the energy to change that much. Like if you like, do a little bit of a rotation or, 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 um, or squeeze it or stretch it a little bit. Um, aside from a few um, very interesting points in chemical space, there's, um, there's, there's not going to be much of a change. So what, what this means is that if we compute the quantum mechanical energy for one molecule, um, for one geometry of one molecule that gives us information about, about similar geometries. So now the question is how we use this information. Um, and this is the part of the talk where it starts getting really trippy, so please stop me if you have questions or if anything is, is, is unclear. Have I, how many of you have, have I lost already? <laughs> okay, this is, this is good. Um, you're either too shy to raise your hands or, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so the way we use this information is we make use of something called Gaussian processes. So if you think back to our, in, like, our Leonard Jones two-dimensional potential example, um, instead of thinking about adjusting two parameters, we think of just all the possible potential energy curves that, that we could draw for the interaction of those two molecules. And then we assign a probability to each individual potential energy surface, potential energy curve, whatever. Um, and so, so, we can, so we can use Bayesian statistics, we can put priors prior probabilities, like we, we already know some things about how, how, how atoms and, and molecules interact. So we can, we can put in that information and, and say like, we want a potential energy surface, well it's going to, going to be very unlikely that the, that the uh, interaction curve is like very squiggly and, or goes like, um, or, or goes very high and very low, and very, and that, that sort of thing. So there are lots of, lots of possible potential energy surfaces that we can basically exclude um, right out front. And then, as we start doing our quantum mechanical data, um, quantum mechanical calculations, that's like adding data to our model, um, and that further constrains, um, further constrains the, the possible predictions. So if you imagine like doing a quantum mechanical calculation, that's one of these red points, if you can see that. What are the axes? Sorry, uh, 
they don't really need to be labeled. This is x, this is f of x. So this is, this is like, you can imagine this is the interatomic distance, um, and this is, is like the potential energy, for example. Um, and, and this is, and this is a 95% confidence interval of like all the different, so if we, if we take, so, so we, have, we have a distribution of our functions that we're doing, right? So, so we're, we're looking at a distribution of our functions that we're constraining by doing quantum mechanical calculations. So, um, so this sort of gives us like how, how tight is that distribution and, and how, how wide is that distribution at, at, at a certain point. And this blue line is the mean of, of that distribution. Is that based on the priors that you said? Um, initially, it's based on the priors, but then as we put in data, it's also based on those. So at some point, this is, this is another way that, um, that, we, that, that Bayesian statistics works, is, um, is, uh, is at first you rely on the prior, but as you add more and more data, then the prior start, the, the exact form of the prior becomes less and less relevant. It just sort of tell, it tells us like, what sort of solution to direct us towards. Because like, if we wanted to fit every single one of these red points exactly, I mean, we could draw a curve that goes through them, but it would be kind of like wild and it would go like whoop, whoop, whoop. And, and, we can, and we can already say, like, we want the length scale of this interaction. We don't want it to be that crazy. We want the length scale to be something like this. And that already, um, and, and so that sort of guides us towards the right, um, the right potentially an energy surface. Like if, what, what would happen if you actually wanted to draw a curve through these points? Okay. Can you say something more about the priors and how you assign the prior? Um, well, that's a little bit difficult and it involves um, what we call covariance functions. So it's, it's like the covariance function is how we measure like how similar any two points, how similar we expect the function values at any two points to be. Like you expect if, if two points are, are very, very close, we'd expect them to have very similar function values, right? Just like with the molecular geometries thing. If they have similar geometries, we expect them to have similar function values. So the question is, how do you measure that? And, and, we, can, and we can put in, and the way we construct that measure is actually one way of, 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 of giving us a prior. Right? So if, if, we, if we make a measure, that, if we make a measure of, of distance, that, that like um, a measure of similarity that spikes when they're very close together and then falls off when they're like this far away, when that's basically zero similarity when they're that far away, then, then we'll end up getting a function that's very, that's, that's very local, that's very, that's very wavy, and, and, and has a very short interaction scale. If, on the other hand, we say these things are still similar if they're maybe this far away or so, then, um, then, then we start giving our interactions a longer length scale. And, and this, is, this is one way that you say to specify the prior. Does that make sense? OK. So, it's, so if everybody's with me so far, we can move on to the case of multidimensional potential energy surfaces. I'm going to add one more dimension, and then we can see how we, and then we can see sort of how this works, um, how, how we predict the potential energy surface um, of, of a molecule. So let's go back to that example of local energies, like we're trying to learn the energy of an atom in a molecule. So what we do is, is we look at this potential energy landscape, and a traditional molecular simulation would be like following a ball rolling along on that landscape. And we'd have to do a new quantum mechanical calculation for every single point, every single snapshot along that trajectory as this ball rolls through the landscape. So what we can do instead um, to, to save quite a bit of computational time, like we can basically reduce our computational effort by a factor of a million if we want to, um, is, is is sort of just scatter the surface with a few samples, um, and w with a few samples. So that's indicated here in this sort of tealish color. Do quantum mechanical, do full quantum mechanical calculations at those samples, and then for any other point that we're interested in. So maybe your ball is sort of like rolling around in this region. Um, if it's at this point exactly, then then we then then we do an interpolation between all these points. Uh, then we do we do this interpolation. We do this. We do this Gaussian process regression, but what it really boils down to is we do a linear interpolation where all the nonlinearity is captured by this covariance function um, that, that measures the similarity of any two points. Right? So we can see there are very thick lines, but how easy is it to see that graphic, actually? The screen is not as big as I expected. So, so between, between these points that are very close, there are very thick lines, so they contribute a lot to the interpolation. And between these and these points that are farther away have thinner lines. They don't they don't contribute as much because they're not as similar. And these points out here they barely contribute at all. So that's the idea behind this interpolation. So we have a linear interpolation, but it's 
but all the nonlinearity in the problem is captured by the covariance kernel. All right, so yeah, we just, we just do this interpolation. What comes out is, is, our, is our gap energy, where gap stands for Gaussian approximation potentials. That's this <coughs> approach that's been developed in our group over the past uh, 10 or so years. And it works very well for solid state systems. Like we, we have a simulator measure or a covariance kernel that, uh, that, works, that works very well for systems like silicon, for iron, uh, works very well for, yeah, for, for diamonds um, and that sort of thing. Tungsten, I think, too. There, yeah, it works very well for, for lots of solid state systems with, with small numbers of components. And at the moment, I'm trying to extend it to, uh, to molecular liquids, to interacting molecules in, inside a liquid. Um, can you use one of these materials as an example to explain um, how you're setting up these calculations? Because um, I thought you had a starting point, like you have a molecule that you know the energy surface of, and you're predicting other configurations with the prior information. So in the case of, say, diamond, yeah. the molecular for the energy levels are known, what are you predicting with that? Well, it's not necessarily that the energy levels are known. I mean, you can, di you can displace the atoms in diamond by some amount, um, in, by some arbitrary random amount in any one direction, and you don't necessarily know the energy of that a priori. You, you'd need to do like a DFT cal calculation, for example, to get the energy of that. So what we can do is, is, can, is can get a sample of, all, of, of a bunch of displacements, um, do our quantum mechanical calculations, and then for something like, uh, I don't know if you know what a phonon calculation is. This is like the calculations of how the atoms vibrate in a lattice. So it requires the, the knowledge of, 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 of many different types of displacements of the crystal lattice, of the energy of many different types of displacements of the crystal lattice. And that tells us like the infrared spectrum, I think. So we can calculate the phonon spectrum using this potential, and it will often be as accurate as the one calculated directly by, by DFT, but it will be much less expensive. Because instead of wasting our, comp our computational effort doing a calculation at each individual displacement that, that we wanted to know about, we instead just interpolate between the ones that we already, that we already know. Does that make sense now? Cool. OK, so yeah, now my job is, is doing this in molecular liquids, in things like hydrocarbon liquids that you might find in diesel or, or, or lubricants. Um, yeah, so um, engine lubricants, I should clarify. And, and I tried this, so first of all, learning the local energy of a long hydrocarbon molecule. And, and it turns, so, so we can use various ways to measure the similarity. We can, we can, we can take just like bond distances within the local environment and, and compare those. And that results in um, a pretty <coughs> substandard potential. So this is the correlation between, um, between the DFT energy, that's what we're trying to predict, um, and our gap energy, the, the, the energy of our model. So in this case, you can see there's basically no correlation and our model failed. So I tried adding in three body terms, so adding in like angles to the description as well. So now our similarity is composed of similarities of bonds and similarities of angles within the local environment. And that gets us much better, actually. Um, it's, it's almost as good as this model that I've, um, well, it's actually better than this model that I've chosen for comparison, which is an empirical sort of fitted potential for, for carbons and hydrogens. And then if we go to this SOAP potential that was used, um, this, the SOAP similarity kernel, which was developed for, for, these, uh, for these solid state systems where all these many body interactions, like not only bonds and angles, but four body and five body terms and a whole bunch of stuff are relevant. Um, in fact, we get a much better correlation. We get something that is about as good as a, as a local cutoff potential could ever be. All right, so that's the local energy. That's all fine and good, but in a liquid, molecules interact, and we need to parameterize that as well. Uh, so e even with, with long molecules, like parts that are moving outside won't necessarily be detected by this local potential. Uh, and we, we could think of making these local environments larger, but if you think about uh, the larger you make this local environment, the larger the space that you sort of have to fill with quantum mechanical calculations in order to, in order to get an accurate, in order to get a, get a sensible, sensible prediction. So it's, um, so it becomes, it, it basically lessens the efficiency of, of your methods the larger you make this thing. So we can't really make our local environments larger, so we have to try another sort of approach. Um, and there are two different approaches. The one that, I'm, th th that we're thinking of, the one that I'm actively working on right now, is to build up from, from small dimer interaction um, surfaces. So you can think of 
there was a potential energy of interaction of a methane dimer. So there are a few parameters. It's like six dimensions, I think. There's the distance between the carbons, and the, there's the rotation of each of the individual monomers. And the reason we chose the methane dimer is because it's such a small system, we can do really accurate um, like quantum chemistry calculations uh, to, to get the interaction energy of this dimer. So, so, we have, uh, so we have a reference that's more accurate than DFT could ever be. And I tried learning the, um, learning the energy with, with uh, a very high dimensional descriptor. And we get the last pretty picture of the talk, which is, uh, so, so basically, the, the black is the energy that we're trying to learn, and all the rest are errors. So the blue <coughs> or purplish thing is what happens when we try to learn, like just to fit Leonard Jones potential to this interaction. Like you try to fit like a sum of Leonard Jones potentials, you know, these things between each of the individual atoms and adjust the parameters until we get something that's as close as possible to this energy. And so it does kind of well um, when, when, the, when the dimers are widely separated, but it completely fails once they get, um, yeah, basically close enough that they're sort of touching. So this is actually a really important part of the potential energy surface to parameterize because when, when molecules are, are interacting in, in, say, a lubricant, they will be pushed very close to each other. And this interaction is part of what's important in determining the viscosity. So we really do want to get this right. And so we learn, uh, I, I, applied, um, I, I, I applied a gap to, um, to, to, to try to learn the couple cluster energies in, in two stages and we get something that is, in fact, much more accurate than it's about as accurate as we could expect the reference energies to be, basically. All right. Um, yeah, so as I said, that's the last pretty picture of the talk. Uh, and to summarize, there are lots of, yeah, there are lots of materials where we have, <clears throat> where we have these, these long-range interactions that are important in determining their properties. And by combining a potential like this, um, if we can, we're, we're currently doing simulations and, and trying to scale it up. So if we can combine this potential with our accurate local um, potential, we can come up with a potential for simulation that is you know, approaching the accuracy of DFT, but at a much lower computational cost, which will actually allow us to do these viscosity simulations with, uh, um, with, with a, a much more accurate potential and, and, and interactions. Um, so yeah, we can, with, with, with a potential like this and, and with, the, with, with this methodology that we can apply to other materials in the future, we can, we can accurately predict how a whole new class of materials will behave and accelerate the design of, of new materials in this class. All right, um, yeah, that's all I have. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my research group, um, as well as Shell, who you may have noticed funded this, <laughs> um, as, as well as the, the, the team at the Shell Technology Center in Bangalore, who taught me quite a bit about hydrocarbon simulation, and you, of course, for listening. Thanks.